Yeah, we can start. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to get the chance to uh, speak uh, in this seminar. Um, I just lost. Can everyone see me? OK, yeah. OK, good. I just lost my gallery of people, so I wanted to make sure everyone could see me. OK. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to talk about some um, fluids like PDEs that arise in some models for uh, in material science. And I want to try to today walk people through some idea of the derivation. I'll be fairly brief on that. Um, but there's a lot of interesting work to be done there on the macroscopic to micros or microscopic to macroscopic picture. But then introduce this, these families of PDEs that arise in these limits and talk about joint work um, with a number of people towards understanding these PDEs. They end up being degenerate parabolic type PDEs. That's why I call them sort of thin film like, because um, that's a sort of similar feature that you see in thin film equations. Um, they're also fourth order, which is another similar feature. Um, and I'm realizing uh, now in particular that I included a little bit more than I expected to about uh, some other work on PDEs. And so I should absolutely acknowledge my other collaborator, Yuan Gao, who's now at Purdue, um, who was also an integral part of understanding a lot of these PDEs as a postdoc at Duke with Jin Feng and, and Zheng Guo. So I'll talk about work with multiple people and try to give you a flavor of what we know about these PDEs. and. Uh, what we don't, um, and there are many open questions, okay? So let me just give you a brief overview. Um, we're gonna consider this uh, a macroscopic model for how a surface evolves. For the most part, we'll talk about it um, just using thermodynamic fluctuations of the crystal surface. And so by that, I mean uh, the atoms can hop from place to place, but for the most part, we'll talk about models where the atoms don't leave the surface and there's nothing depositing onto the surface. I will show you at one point um, how you can incorporate both effects um, in a model and uh, talk a little bit about that. But for the most part, we'll focus on just fluctuations on the surface, okay? We're gonna consider the height of the crystal to be some unknown, some function h of x comma t, which we wanna figure out how to solve. And one key thing about these surfaces, I'll show you an image here in a minute, um, is that, Interesting features that form in these types of processes are called facets. And so these are long steps uh, of very flat length heights um, where the, you would imagine the gradient would be zero. And so one interesting question one can ask is, is, is there a way to see sort of facets in macroscopic dynamics? Um, because some ways that these macroscopic dynamics are derived actually are given by people considering interactions of the steps themselves, the facets themselves, okay? So how do these models arise? Well, you can do a few things. One, you could do like a full molecular dynamic simulation, okay? And that's obviously quite intensive. Um, you can create statistical physics models. This is more along the lines of what I've done, um, which is to uh, consider a, a basically a Monte Carlo process where you have a, a, a rate likelihood of moving from one site to another. And then you wanna consider uh, the ensemble average of these objects, okay? There are also a few other models um, I won't talk about here that involve this ODE representation of how these edges, these the, the terraced edges of a facet move. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that too much. Um, so maybe I should put, a, put just a dash here. Um, and then, of course, the goal that we have from any of these models is to develop like a macroscopic average um, PDE representation of the crystal surface. Okay. So there are two goals that I've had for this project um, in it for a long time. And one is more statistical physics. Uh, uh, and I won't talk about that too much today. Um, but this is the, a major question, and it's very much open. Um, how to connect the microscopic models to the macroscopic models rigorously. Um, these are related to ideas of relative entropy. 
Um, for instance, uh, in the work of, of Funaki and Spohn and, and Yao. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting question to see how to do that for the models that we're working on. And that's, I'm, I am working on that in, in various directions um, with, uh, with collaborators, uh, Anya Kutsevich and Amarjeet Budaraja. Um, and uh, the other question from a more PD perspective is, you know, we can observe, we can derive these limits from a more, let's say, applied math point of view. And we can observe that they do a very good job capturing the, the model. And so if you just start with the PDEs, you know, what are the what are the features of that PDE that we can learn things about? What kind of qualitative behaviors can we prove things about the dynamics of the PDEs? Okay. So here's a picture of one of these uh, from an electron microscope from a, a physics group at Penn, I believe. Forgot to put the citation in. But you can see you've got these like long flat lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, you can see you've got these long flat regions. And then you've got these. Uh, everything working OK? OK, now it's fine. Yeah. OK, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry, yeah. Um, and these are features that people would like to understand, right? Like that the, the steps form, how the steps interact. Um, but you also see, of course, there are all these little mounds there are, and there are little holes. All of these are, are interesting features that can form because of the, uh, the, the oscillation, the, the movement of the jumps of the atoms from one side to another, okay? So we're gonna consider a, a very simple toy model of this, which is, uh, uh, and what's called a solid on solid model or uh, an atomic model. And we're going to prescribe a, a rate. So you give me a, an atom arranged in a lattice, and we're going to take, in particular, fixed integer heights, like the lattice has a fixed discrete height. And um, you, uh, an atom can choose to move from a site. Uh, based on essentially an energy that we assign for how many bonds it has to break. So if I were to just uh, do a bond counting argument, right, you would see that this has a, uh, it sees only two nearest neighbors. It would have very few bonds to break. It would be very likely to break. Whereas here, it's in a much tighter configuration and it's unlikely to move from that spot. That's sort of the idea of the statistical physics process, okay? And we're gonna, so that gives you an energy barrier and it and an atom has to overcome that energy barrier in order to move. And we're only gonna let it move one side at a time. That's a, the family of rate models that we have, okay? Now, because of that, right? If you macroscopically, you might expect, right? That here you have a convex region and here you, or so here you have a concave region and here you have a convex region. You might expect those to behave very differently. Uh, there might, you would expect maybe there to be a, a symmetry breaking between convexity and concavity. Um, and we'll come back to that question more a little bit later. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, no. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So what is the, what do we consider as a, as the, how do we set up the rates? Well, we consider um, jumps, right? We consider a, a system where you can we have a discrete representation of the height profile of the lattice. And then you can move from one portion of the lattice, you can move from site alpha to site beta. Uh, uh, so this says remove something at site alpha and add it to site beta. Um, and then you can uh, uh, look at the new energy from that configuration. Um, and to use the energy, that gives us an abil ability to set the rates. So how do we set the rates? Well, we define the entire surface energy. Um, and here, this is the sort of generalization that John Weir and I um, introduced, which is we consider the surface energy to be given by an interaction potential V, which we generally want to be convex. You know, key examples, uh, call it V of S, would be S or V of S equals S to the P, uh, in particular S squared is a very interesting one. Um, and uh, we consider the total interaction, the surface energy to be the, the interaction potential for the, for the difference of the, of the discrete gradient, okay? And then we define this so-called coordination number to be the energy of exchanging an atom, 
So basically what, what the underlying idea of this coordination number is, is it's like a symmetric change in energy that results from removing an atom, right? If I have this as a surface energy, if I try to remove an atom from a site, how much will the energy change, okay? And we've symmetrized it by looking both to the left and to the right, okay? Then we define rates. Uh, these are the add atom rates. And from those, we can define a nice Monte Carlo process, um, describe a generator, and from there, try to move forward and understand uh, what this ensemble average looks like, okay? We have a, a nice equilibrium measure. And, uh, uh, with, and the reason, by the way, that we have uh, sort of a zero here is that I told you this is a conservative model, right? Atoms can move, but they can't leave. Okay, so that's why you have this sort of microcanonical ensemble where you're restricting to a given L1 norm of the, of the surface height, okay? And we'd like to sort of take a, micros a macroscopic limit of that. So a couple notes on the model. Obviously, this is a simple mathematical model, right? Uh, and you could argue that it's not necessarily capturing all the physics you would like to understand from a system like this, okay? But, uh, you know, it does do a pretty good job of capturing key features about the, the rates of how atoms tend to move when confined by bonds with neighbors, okay? So it's dominated by a change in energy. And of course, it's a Markovian process. So I mentioned a few examples. Let me just show you what those, what those two key examples, the linear and the quadratic interaction potential give you. This just becomes a bond counting model. It's a very uh, popular common model. It says, hey, uh, what's the energy? Well, it depends just on the number of bonds I have to break, okay? Interestingly enough, if I have a quadratic interaction potential, I get basically something that looks like a discrete Laplacian, okay? Those are the two types of ways that you could measure curvature to some extent nearby, and that curvature tells you how likely you are to leave, okay? Okay, so we don't include, there are lots of features you might include uh, in a full version of this that let's say material scientists or quantum chemists might run. Um, you know, they would include substrates where there are different levels of interaction. They might have different, they might have defects. They might have different types of materials all embedded together. Um, but when you go to talks on people simulating these, uh, uh, these surface interactions, these like deposition and evaporation uh, uh, models, they have kinetic Monte Carlo processes that are, you know, more complicated, but remarkably close to our toy model here, okay? These are not uh, terribly far from models that have been studied before, but without, so these models that have been studied before were continuous height profiles. So they were models that were given by basically uh, large systems of, of ODEs, of stochastic ODEs, driven by a gradient flow. So you see that you still have a similar surface energy, uh, but, now, uh, uh, you will, uh, but now you allow those heights to depend continuously, and you, uh, in this case, allow them to vary um, with some Brownian motion. And now uh, you, would, you can argue with me, and it, uh, you should argue with me that this would give me a second order problem. And I, told, I promised you that I would be doing fourth order problems. You would be exactly right. This is a model for not crystal surface relaxation on its own thermodynamic fluctuations, but evaporation and deposition, which does generically give you second order models. Um, and they showed that that limits via relative entropy type method to a given type of uh, PDE, which is second order, um, where this, this sigma C here is, we call it sigma C because uh, for C being for continuous, is called the surface tension, okay? Um, it's related also, some of you might be familiar with this, it's related to something you might think of as mobility of a model like this. 
And it comes by looking at the gradient of the free energy where you integrate over all space. And the reason you integrate is because, of course, you have a continuous height profile, OK? So we can actually compute, uh, to some extent, what that is in this case. Um, and uh, there's also a conservative version of that model that was worked on by a student of Funaki, whose name was Nishikawa. And this is where you get the, now you see this extra Laplacian out here. This is a conservative model, right? This is a fourth order model. Um, and that's also why there's this extra weight on the Brownian motion, because you, you want to make sure that it's also, uh, that the randomness is conservative. And there they derived a very similar type of fourth order PDE, where you have the Laplacian of the divergence of the surface tension evaluated at the gradient, okay? Okay. Interestingly enough, there's some recent work by Armstrong and Wu that analyzes this surface tension for the, for the funaki spohn model, also known as the, the, the gradient phi surface model. And they show um, that that surface tension has sufficient regularity um, and derive some properties out of it, which is pretty pretty useful for the regularity theory, as you can imagine, for that type of PDE, okay? Now, we had a discrete process with discrete heights. Funaki and Spohn and Nishikawa had a continuous height process. And you could say, well, can I relate those two? And there have been some material scientists who, who have worked on this by saying, okay, let me scale this interaction potential and assume that the heights are going to zero. Um, and then to the, uh, some formal convergence of these two models has been understood by Hasselbunter and Bedensky. Um, this is very much from a, a material science point of view. Still needs to be understood, okay? So small lattice constant limit might have uh, uh, some interesting convergence features. Now, one key feature of that model that I mentioned to you from Funaki and Spohn is that if the potential V is symmetric, then Hn and H and minus Hn are solutions, okay? So convex and concave symmetry is effectively what I'm getting at. The peak and the valley behave very similarly in these, in these models. But like I told you, that kinetic Monte Carlo model, it sort of saw convexity and concavity differently, right? Convex regions are stickier than concave regions, right? If you're in a valley, you have a lot of bonds to break, very hard to escape that energetically. If you're at a peak, very few bonds to break, very easy to escape that energetically, okay? This um, model that we worked on with the KMC in the bond counting model was first uh, studied by a very beautiful paper of Krug, Dobbs, and Majaniemi, my apologies, where they, derived, again, somewhat formally, um, the following fourth order PDE effectively. So, so I say effectively because um, here we have generalized this notion of what we call sigma D, the discrete surface tension, okay? We've generalized that um, to any interaction potential. But the Krug et al. paper um, actually computed a formula for sigma d, a very beautiful formula for sigma d when you have just the bond counting model. Um, you can actually solve this problem and write down what sigma d is uh, uh, implicitly. And it, gives a, it actually gives an interesting related models to the ones that we'll, we'll land on. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But so what's the difference between these models? Our surface tension is not the gradient of a free energy where I have integrated. It is the gradient of a free energy where I have summed over the discrete processes or the discrete heights, okay? That has some implications. Um, now, in the Krug et al. paper, they also, at the very end, give arguments saying, well, the model could also be this one where you include the exponential and that exponential, remember, it comes from the fact that there's an exponential in the rates, right? That's how you determine the likelihood of, of moving. Um, and of course, when the curvature is small, right? If this is small, then you tailor expand and you get exactly the original PDE with no exponential, okay? 
Now, it also turns out that if you do that Taylor expansion, convexity and concavity are symmetric. But with that exponential, they turn out to be very, very non-symmetric, OK? Which PDE you get, whether you can Taylor expand or you cannot Taylor expand, depends on the scaling limit that you study in the surface, OK? Um, we have, so with, with Weir, uh, we developed two different scaling regimes, one of which leads to the non-exponential PDE with sigma d. And interestingly enough, when you do the scaling limit that keeps the exponential, you actually get rid of sigma d and you get sigma c. So let me just quickly show you some simulations we did for comparison to the microscopic model. So this is for the, the scaling limit, um, which you can see here. This is what we call the smooth scaling limit. It's the one where the Taylor expansion of the exponential happens. So this is our model PDE. And you see it, um, it this is a, we took a sine wave initial profile and we evolved it for a fixed period of time. And this is with the quadratic interaction potential. And you can see a very beautiful fit as we increase N, you get closer and closer to the PDE solution. And so these are, you know, we did many ensemble averages of the KMC process. And then we increase the size of the crystal and we can see this beautiful fit to our PDE, okay? We also um, did it for the, the, the interesting feature of the bond counting model. And you'll notice, so you notice there are no facets here, right? Like everything's smooth, okay? And that leads to, uh, again, it's also got symmetric evolution, but it does, the, the, the V equals absolute value of X model does flatten out a lot more than the, V equals uh, Z squared model, okay? So <clears throat> what, if any, features of sigma D are essential here, okay? So we have sigma D, that's what we know, but what have we lost? Well, the truth is on a large scale, it's very, very hard to tell the difference between sigma D and sigma C. So I'm gonna write a conjecture here. is that the homogenization argument long time dynamics of the sigma d system are very close to the sigma c system. Now, the reason is when you look at these surface tensions, what you realize is that what does this sigma D do? Well, it introduces oscillations around the sigma C profile. Um, I, I, I didn't include a lot of plots because I wanted to get to the PDEs faster, um, but there's a very interesting question here about the relationship between sigma D and sigma C, okay? I'm happy to analyze, analyze that more, but you could ask which one's correct? Does the KMC model converge to the version with sigma D or does it converge to the version with sigma C? And the answer was found by looking at the flux on small scales in time, okay? And what you observe would be the red line is sigma the sigma C evolution. And then the black and the blue are our sigma D flux and the computed flux on the ensemble average. So you can see that sigma D very clearly is describing the actual local dynamics of the, of the KMC model. But sigma C is very clearly picking out some average structure of it, but you can observe the oscillations around it are, are, are quite steep. So the convergence of these two models, in particular on long time scales, um, would be a very interesting open question, okay? And of course, uh, so now how do I keep the exponential? Well, now I'm gonna change my scaling limit. Um, you have to choose Q is P over P minus one, where the way to think about this is, so we're assuming that V is homogeneous of degree P. So in particular, we consider things like this as simple models, okay? And notice that in this case, 
we're going to make p bigger than one. And the reason is, of course, because of that condition. Now you scale that way, and our microscopic to macroscopic limits spit out the exponential PDE, where this now is, I'm going to just point out, this looks quite a lot like the P Laplacian of H. Okay. So this is kind of our, our, our new PDE model, Laplacian of the exponential of minus P Laplacian of the surface profile is what's driving the parabolic dynamics. You can imagine that's quite degenerate. So, but let's look at some comparisons. Um, well, the dynamics you see are very different. In particular, notice that we've broken the symmetry between the concave region and the convex region very strongly. And over time, we actually seem to form this singularity. And I'll get back to that. So what's interesting is what you realize is that concave regions, you've taken the exponential of essentially a curvature, and but with a different sign, right? So here you take the positive exponential of the curvature, you get fast diffusion, and near the convex region, you take the you take the exponential and you get the the and you take the minus Laplacian, so you get uh, slow diffusion, and that that difference between rates leads to kit leads numerically, I should say, to this singularity formation. And I'll get a little bit. I'll try to get into how much we know about that singularity formation from the existence theory of various types of PDEs. Okay. So here, let me just point out, here we have fast diffusion. And here we have slow diffusion. OK. Any questions so far? Uh, no, continue, yeah. OK, cool. So let's focus on the PDEs. So first of all, um, to this type of PDE, where you have uh, this sort of uh, exponential of the P Laplacian, we don't know that this had appeared before, although it's close, like I said, to that of the exponential PDE mentioned in Krug, uh, Dobbs, and Majani Yamiya. Okay. What can we say about these types of PDEs? This is the PDE that I would like to focus on for the rest of the talk. Okay. How does it behave? What can we say about it from the macroscopic point of view? Also, I want to emphasize it's still a big open question. Do we understand the microscopic convergence to the PDE? And I will say I went ahead and included both of these because they are, of course, connected. Um, if you typically want to show a relative entropy type convergence argument, you do it via effectively energy estimates, which means you need, you need to understand something about the macroscopic model, okay? So these are, these are, I'll just point out that these are connected as one is typically required. I had kind of hoped that by understanding the microscopic model, one could develop a good strategy for convergence uh, of like finding weak solutions of one. Um, but that's really not how the, these sorts of uh, uh, relative entry methods work. Okay. But let's just focus on one. And in one, there are still a lot of great questions that we can ask about the qualitative behavior. Okay. So let me show you a little bit about how these things behave. Okay, so in the case where we have just the non exponential, um, we can go also to two dimensions and you expect sort of nice um, evolution. We do, don't actually expect singularity formation. Okay, um, and for a full range of sigmas, uh, I, uh, the, the, without the exponential, um, you still need, this can still be, uh, somewhat complicated and you need information about, about sigma in order to 
get even local results. Um, but effectively, you expect this to converge to a constant uh, over time. Okay. Now, for the exponential, <clears throat> you, you evolve the same thing forward, and you actually can you can generically form these singularities, and they form where there was slow diffusion, where the minima of the initial data formed. Okay. So, can we prove the existence of weak solutions? Can we uh, analyze the singularity formation? Can we prove that there are strong solutions in a certain sense? And I will talk about those results, um, both mine and others, uh, soon. Okay, so here are some things that we have managed to observe numerically about these types of PDEs, both types of PDEs. One is that um, the long time, the evolution of these things towards equilibrium, I will mention that both of these tend to be you know, get driven towards equilibrium, where the crystal surface spreads out uniformly on the longest time scale possible, okay? Both of these uh, seem to approach equilibrium in a self-similar fashion, okay? So one question for these types of PDEs is uh, similarity solutions. These have not been very well understood, okay? Another very, very interesting feature about these PDEs is that uh, if I look in the smooth case, okay, so this is smooth um, and this is exponential. Right, the smooth case behaves very much like a standard heat equation. You get support everywhere instantly, even if you start off with compactly supported initial data. Right. So the, the 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 atoms, you know, the macroscopic model spreads instantaneously to the whole domain. However, in the exponential problem, you see we observe this what appears to be effectively a finite speed of propagation. Right. So uh, we start off with a localized smooth profile. We evolve it over time, and here this is zoomed in uh, at this point, right? And he, you see that as you moved forward in time, the diffusion uh, saw things instantaneously, uh, and the exponential, there's a region that's very, very strongly zero, okay? So can we prove a finite speed of propagation for this type of problem? This is, by the way, with, this is for V, the quadratic interaction potential. This is this still happens, okay? With the exponential. Uh, this is a 2D slice, but you see a very similar picture, okay? As I just took a, a slice through one, uh, one direction, okay? So what are some things we can say about these PDEs? Well, for the... For the smooth PDE, we can use very similar results to those of Nishikawa, Fernaki, and Spohn. And one thing you can observe is that uh, this is uh, that h dot minus one norm is decreasing. Okay, this is like a, and it's kind of reasonable to see this as an h dot minus one gradient flow. Okay. Ooh, sorry. You can see that in both cases, actually. Both cases have this feature. Okay. Uh, now, you can also observe that the quote unquote surface energy, which is related to the surface tension, decreases in both cases, which is just a, it's just a simple calculation, okay? Which is important because that's something we expect to be decreasing under the evolution of our problem. The surface energy should be relaxing. We can also observe for this type of problem that in the, in the exponential case that, well, there are a few special solutions, obviously constants or even uh, gradient constant, but also in the exponential case, a P harmonic function would be a special solution um, or what I call a P elliptic function, which is where the P Laplacian is the log of a harmonic function, okay? Each of these would be stationary solutions to that problem, and we know nothing about their stability or anything of that magnitude. So that would be the, the stability of these types of stationary solutions would be big open question.
Okay. So now let's focus on the exponential PDE. Um, and let's think about a slightly different model. Okay. Because I told you before that in the KMC model, we couldn't quite derive the P equals one Laplacian. Okay. However, we revisited that problem with Dio Margetis and Zheng Walu and Zhen Feng Lu. And it turns out this is kind of an interesting exponential version of the total variation flow of giga cone, giga, giga, for instance. And uh, it looks like this in 1D. Very beautiful problem. So, but you recognize what is this? This is exactly the one Laplacian of H, right? That's like the uh, that's like the exponential of the total variation. So the, uh, it's a very it, well, it's like the almost like total variation with this exponential weight. Okay. Now what we did in that paper was we analyzed the dynamics. So notice, right? Anywhere that that dx is that anywhere that h is uh, dx is non-zero, right? then this is just one or minus one, and that would be zero, that wouldn't be changing. So what this leads to is basically like a free boundary value problem for how changes in the, in the sign of the derivative change, and they introduce facet dynamics. So there was beautiful work of Giga analyzing how to build weak solutions to the non-exponential version of this problem, and he built weak solutions um, of basically facet-like solutions. So, you know, he had a set of ODEs and he analyzed a solution where this uh, distance here would be like, uh, so this would be like XF of T and this height would be like HF of T. And you can build solutions uh, that solve these ODEs and construct these sort of shock-like solutions that solve the problem and actually are weak solutions. Um, again, technically that case wouldn't show up from the add atoms. However, you could also, you can play around with that and do a temperature rescaling, or you can come from steps and you can derive this as a, as a model, okay? Um, and then we can ask uh, from those models, uh, can we capture shocks, okay? Turns out we can, but because of the exponential, things are much more complicated. You don't just get a ODE system describing shock formation or describing facet evolution. You get a DAE system, a differential algebraic system of equations. There's also a little bit of a problem here, which is that while we were able to derive these model ODEs for this solution, we do not know that weak solutions exist for the P equals one problem. So question, is a facet solution a weak solution of the P equals one exponential PDE? We don't know. Weak solutions for that problem are very open, okay? There's some work of Yuan Gao, uh, my collaborator, uh, on a similar problem. I'll just say with a log with a log difference. So rather than handling the one Laplacian, she handled something that was just integrable, and she could she could analyze the weak solutions. But the p equals one, we don't know. Okay. Interestingly enough, this PDE has some nice structure um, of, you know, basically like a conservation law like picture. Okay, that's kind of how we think about driving it. Um, we use kind of an ideal gas law type type picture. But what you can realize is that there's an underlying um, there's an underlying type of gradient flow built into this problem with an exponential mobility. Okay, so. This picture, this hydrodynamic picture, indicates uh, a gradient flow with 
with exponential mobility. Now we'll get to that. Um, so we've also sort of tried to work on a on a more unified approach to the macroscopic to, to microscopic limit um, in order to derive this very carefully from the from the atom, atomistic dynamics as well. Um, but I, I don't want to go into that too much. Okay, so let's look at the evolution of these types of problems. Start with this is initial data. Just a sine wave. This is the total variation flow. And this is the exponential total variation flow. OK, and you see it once again, you have convex and concave symmetry here. And here it's broken. You get diffusion, you get fast diffusion, slow diffusion. And that's actually predicted very nicely by our ODE system. Now, how did I actually solve this problem numerically? I, of course, had to regularize, right? Question is, how close is my regularized system to the actual P equals one PDE? That's a, that's a very good question, okay? But I can compare the evolution of my, OD, of my differential algebraic system to my PDE, and we observe it's remarkably good fit. Our ODEs do a remarkably good job of predicting the dynamics. Okay. However, I'll point out we do not have an analytic proof that those ODEs give me a solution to this problem or that a solution exists for this PDE. Okay. Okay. I'll get to that though. We're close, we're getting close. Um, it just this is just a slightly different version. But again, you can see in multiple settings. We just saw a beautiful fit of our ODE system to the to the dynamics of the of the PDE. Okay. Now, how can we think about these PDEs as gradient flows? <clears throat> well, consider uh, uh, an energy which is like a, a, a slightly regularized. This uh, cubic is sort of like a, a, a from the work of Mullins. It's like a very common correction to include in material science. But you see here, I have the one Laplacian energy. And I might regularize that a little bit, OK? And if G is greater than 0, it turns out that you, that you break the need to form a jump, OK? Uh, let me show you the evolution, right? Notice you still form very flat-like features for G positive, but you don't have the jump features anymore. Now, it's easier to prove things about the dynamics of these models, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. However, it is harder to establish a model for the width of this facet, which you can do very well when G is zero, right? So it's a, it's a, there are regularization and convergence of the regularized models is an interesting question. Convergence. Of regularized models to TV. Like I said, TV is nice because we can get explicit descriptions of how the surfaces move. Uh, the convergence, the, the regularized models are nice because hey, they actually have weak solutions, right? And we can, and they don't even have they don't have jumps. How close are they? Open question. Okay. I want to also say that with uh, Yuan Gao and Jin Guo Lu and Jin Feng Lu and Anya Kutsevich, we considered a different type of rate where instead of considering only local energy cost, you actually consider a metropolis style rate where you say, OK, uh, let's look at the total energy difference of that move. And it leads to some interesting related PDEs that are, are also thin film like. So you see, but now we have the third derivative of the exponential. And we've studied the, the uh, similar properties of this model. Um, and uh, uh, my, my former student, Anya Kutsevich, has done a really a beautiful uh, set of work recently understanding more about the convergence of this model and about the, um, the, the PDEs in question. So let's, oh, I'm sorry, I accidentally repeated that slide. 
Um, I also wanted to say that Anya and, and Amarjeet and I are working, particularly in the case where we have quadratic interaction potential to try to get some discrete version of relative entropy, okay? So let's talk a little bit in my last five or 10 minutes here about, uh, about progress on analyzing these PDEs because there has been some made, okay? So in particular, um, it, this started with work by Jenguo Lu and Zhu, um, where they proved global weak solutions for this PDE. And I'll talk a little bit about how to do that. And then work continued with Jenguo and Yuan um, and then also uh, with me and Jin Fang. Um, but there are also a period of some interesting works by Jin Guo and Bob Strain, uh, uh, Granero Balanchon and Maglioka, and also Dave Ambrose on small data analytic solutions to these types of PDEs. Now I'm gonna focus here, I wanna mention, I'm focusing here on the quadratic interaction potential, okay? Not much is known, in other cases at the moment, but I'll talk to you a little bit about that right towards the very end, I hope, okay? In this set of models, you can include um, some evaporation and deposition terms, and this would be the most general form of the model. You have the fourth order piece, and you have this second order correction, okay? Now, interestingly enough, if you let u be e to the minus Laplacian h, you can recast this, and you see now here how close we really are to a thin film model, right? Like this looks like minus U. If this were, if the derivatives were arranged slightly differently here, this would be a thin film model, right? Uh, in the, that's in the second order case. And then we have, of course, plus this beautiful modified porous medium, right? So here we have thin film like. And here we have a correction that's like a porous medium. Okay. So if we can prove existence to this problem where the solution remains positive and regular, then we can recast that as a solution to the original problem in terms of the heights. Okay. So uh, that's some progress has been made. Like I said, there are two main approaches. Uh, one is the analytic uh, small data global strong using Wiener algebras. And one is uh, large data global weak solutions. And that relies, the, the most elegant formulations of that rely very much on the sort of entropy solution approach of Bernice and Fried. okay? So I'll just remind you that the Wiener algebra space here, um, we're gonna, what you consider are sort of weighted LP spaces. Um, and in particular, there's a generalization of that um, where you can also put in uh, an e to the minus sigma of t uh, uh, right so you can put in an exponentially decaying term that will give you um, analyticity and this is actually the space that Ambrose worked in to prove that not only can you get global strong solutions for small data but you can see that they have an increasing radius of analyticity as you evolve forward, they're getting more and more smooth, okay? And, uh, but only for small data. So those wedding simulations that I showed you, those were obviously instances of large curvature. Large curvature, I can't tailor expand, and I actually would expect, you know, an analytic space to be like the radius of analysis to be decreasing. And I have a student working on that problem right now to show large data uh, existence, you know, analytic initial data decreasing radius of analyticity. Um, but you can also uh, uh, um, do the same thing uh, that Ambrose did in our general model with second order corrections and construct solutions, okay? And it's just a bootstrapping argument using some elegant, uh, the, the fact that the Wiener algebra space and the, rate, the analytic spaces allow you to really effectively control the Taylor expansion of the exponential. Okay, so let me just write that here, uh, idea, analytic spaces allow control on Taylor expansion. of e 
this each of six. Okay. Okay, I mentioned also global weak solutions, and this is for any data, much more regular. And for that, like I said, you have to introduce a proper regularization, and again, motivated by uh, the sort of Bernice and Friedman work, this is the type of regularization that we study. Um, we prove uniform uh, uh, energy estimates on this type of problem. And then we prove convergence as epsilon goes to zero to a global weak solution that is positive almost everywhere. And that's what allows us to construct the weak solutions for the problem, okay? So very quickly, let me um, highlight the basic questions that remain unanswered. Does there exist a, a, that the exponential PDE has a solution when P equals one? But in particular, there are a lot of values of P where this hasn't been written down. Now, between P, P between one and two, I expect uh, we have actually ideas for it, and, and I, I expect it's possible, but it needs to be done in order to understand these things better, um, especially also that regularized model that I mentioned. Um, and then, like I said, another big thing is, uh, can we prove the convergence? But the last thing that I want to mention, and this is also part of my students' project, um, is that it would be really nice to try to understand that in these exponential models, you form finite time singularity for my kid, form, form uh, it, finite time singularities in the second derivative, right? So you'd like to classify those singularities uh, and uh, model what they look like. And we have some ideas using self-similar coordinates, what's actually going on um, with some careful numerics and calculations. Um, and But the wedding problem is completely open. And also, like I said, the, the motion equilibrium through self-similarity is also completely open. Okay. Um, do I have just two more minutes to introduce this one more quick notion for the what for the P equals one case? Um, hello. Yes. Continue again. Yeah. Okay. I just want. I. Uh, do, do, would you rather me end in like one or two minutes, or or do I have okay, until okay. ten? Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, you have two minutes to. Yeah. Okay. Great. Let me just. So let me very quickly then just show you what I meant by my gradient flow structure. Okay. So again, let me think about a P Laplacian energy. Okay. How can I formulate? Let's fix the P equals one Laplacian energy in this formulation. Here's the formal gradient flow structure, right? This looks like <clears throat> this operator, divergence of M grad, where M is this horribly nonlinear function of the, of the second derivatives of H, okay? And then the, the energy that I would be working with to get the gradient flow structure is, like grad H, right? It's, or it's like the it's like the total variation norm. Okay. So it with this formal gradient flow structure, you can start to try to analyze these PEs using things like JKO type schemes. Okay. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time walking through our recent advances on that with Katie Craig, Jin Guo, Jin Fang, and Li Wang at Minnesota. Um, we have made progress. Uh, we can prove a JKO-like scheme converges with a with a with with a regularization. Okay, um, a slight regularization of this, and but we can build uh, uh, schemes that that really start to approach the idea of what a weak solution should look like. And my my claim is that this is M is it's called M here is the mobility is that there are actually a lot of examples of this form, okay? So one is an H minus one gradient flow. H is like the Wasserstein two gradient flow. Non-negative concave, there's a weighted gradient flow. Um, but ours is one of the most nonlinear functions that I've ever encountered, okay? And so it's, it's far out of any existing theories. But any uh, building families of solutions for these type of ODEs 
is a very important framework right now, um, in particular with these developments uh, um, of the of the Wasserstein flow as a formulation of this type of uh, weighted weighted gradient flow. Um, and I will point you to that paper, um, which I believe I hope I, I, it's one. Of, I'm very happy with it. It's very easy to read, but I will just point out that we have sort of like a Jordan Kindler auto scheme laid out for how to solve that problem. And importantly, one of the things we resolve in that paper is that is that this operator that's a very intense operator because of this nonlinear mobility. This has a very terrible condition number. So in particular, we introduce a scheme where we never have to solve we never have to compute the inverse of this matrix. And that's really the strength of our um, of our uh, optimization scheme for the construction of weak solutions. But I will mention it only works for uh, a slightly regularized version because we need, in the end, the mobility to be an L1 function. Um, but anyway, so I, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that with questions. I will leave you with this beautiful gradient flow structure for this type of PDE. And I hope that I have at least it interested you in these uh, simple and yet uh, very open and fascinating uh, uh, flows that that tell you some both things about material science and have really interesting uh, sort of gradient flow structures. Um. Hello, finish? Yes. Okay. Um, 